lecture we'll be going over special rehabilitation of conditions that were commonly seen in the shoulder. So starting off we're going to talk about a scapular dyskinesis or sometimes called six scapula. Uh, this stands for um, scapular malpositioning is what the S stands for, inferior medial border prominence, and then um, the coracoid pain and malpositioning is the C, and then the last K is for kinesis of scapular movement. So in signs and symptoms, and you can see in this picture that the pro, there is a protracted um, scapula being show, shown. The shoulder is typically lower, the one that's involved. Um, if you palpate the coracoid process, it's tender. Um, also, if you ask them to do elevation of the involved arm, um, they'll start to complain of tenderness of the coracoid process after three to five repetitions. And then scapular movement as they move um, is not smooth and it's kind of um, kind of ratchety um, rather than a smooth, smooth scapular um, movement. Causes are usually because of muscle imbalances. We've got tight muscles anteriorly as well as weak posteriorly. Um, resulting in um, a pattern of firing that is um, shows poor recruitment. The results are, um, if left alone, can lead to instability of the glenohumeral joint, um, rotator cuff impingement, and tendinopathy, as well as rotator cuff tears. Um, the primary treatment for six scapula is um, starting with posture correction, making them aware of what normal scapular posture should be. Um, stretching tight structures, strengthening those that are weak, using the tape um, to keep the scapula um, protract or retracted, um, and as a cueing reminder. Um, soft tip shoe mobilization is often used for um, massage, especially the anterior musculature. Might involve transverse friction massage um, of the pec tendon um, and um, of the upper traps. Flexibility. Uh, oftentimes using joint mobilization um, to get this the uh, glenohumeral joint to lay back into the socket um, and so it's easier to do scapular um, retracting. Also just doing flexibility of the, um, the pecs and the upper trap. Strengthening primarily will concentrate on the serratus anterior and middle and lower trapezius exercises. And then working on um, pattern of firing, teaching them to um, keep that scapula back and retracted prior to elevation of the extremity. The next condition is um, shoulder instability. <clears throat> and the, the stability of our shoulder, as we talked about in the previous lecture, is through static and dynamic restraints. And injury to either of those restraints will cause changes in the neural output and add to instability of the shoulder. The anterior instability is most common. Um, there are two um, more common instabilities um, or structures that we see. The first one is termed the AMBRI, the A-M-B-R-I. It means atraumatic, multi-directional, so many directions of instability, bilateral, rehabilitation effective, and then inferior capsular shift required if rehab fails. That's called the AMBRI. So the treatment for somebody um, that's been diagnosed with this condition is um, starting general range of motion um, and in any plane that is restricted, um, strengthening scapula stabilizers, rotator cuff, deltoid, using lots of PNF patterns. Um, teaching the patient um, education in order to avoid subluxations or dislocations, so keeping the upper extremity out of the abducted, externally rotated position. Lots of pro um, proprioceptive training is done, um, and there are several examples in the book. And then eccentric strengthening needs to be obtained before they return to their sport. So somebody that has an, <clears throat> an anterior instability, um, or an ombre multidirectional instability. We'll be doing lots of strengthening of the scapula and the glenohumeral joint. The second condition that is in your notes is termed TUBS, and TUBS is a traumatic unilateral Bankart lesion, surgery required. So this is somebody who is dislocated um, with a traumatic injury on one side. Um, oftentimes the Bankart lesion is involved and surgery is um, required. So there's a picture 
um, the unilateral dislocation. Um, what is a bank heart lesion? A bank heart lesion is a tear of the anterior labrum due to repetitive dislocations. However, it could happen with just one dislocation. And um, a surgical procedure is required in order um, to fix this. The surgical procedure then is um, they trim the joint capsule up, um, they go in and holes are drilled to the edge of the glenoid cavity, and then the um, sutures are placed in through the capsule and ligament to hold that together. General rehabilitation um, for anybody with um, a dislocation will have some limits. So in your notes, there are some guidelines that talk about um, what are some precautions with somebody that has an anterior instability. Um, they need to limit abduction and external rotation. Um, the external rotation will be limited from about 0 to 30 degrees. Um, <clears throat> they have to be careful that they don't push that um, glenoid head back out through the anterior portion of the capsule. So exercises that need to be avoided would be the flies um, because the elbow comes back behind the shoulder and that um, glenoid head comes anterior um, pushing through the anterior capsule. Um, pull downs, especially um, doing like a lat pull down behind the head. Um, push ups, again the elbow comes behind the shoulder, bench press, military press, all those need to be avoided until um, there is good healing um, and structural integrity. With a posterior instability, we'll avoid um, internal rotation with horizontal adduction. That's the position that puts the most vulnerable into re-dislocating posteriorly. So exercises to avoid would be um, anything that's in like the weight bearing, like a, um, a push-up or um, a bench press um, or chest flies where the arms are up over the head um, and then they relax and that uh, glenoid head comes posterior in the joint. <clears throat> so those are, again, limited early in the rehab um, until they heal well. And inferior instability, somebody has dislocated inferiorly, although this is common, um, or not common, <laughs> and if you do see it, it's probably in association with an anterior and posterior instability, so a multi-directional instability. Um, but if they have had an incident of inferior instability, we're going to avoid full elevation. This causes the glenoid head to go inferior. Um, and so exercises that we're going to avoid are um, things like military press and then shrugs and um, elbow curls. Um, as you contract the biceps, the long head of the biceps comes um, up over the top of the glenoid head and it contracts and pushes the um, head of the humerus down in the fossa and we want to avoid that movement. All right, moving on to shoulder impingement. You could categorize impingement into primary or secondary impingement. A primary impingement is a narrowing of the subacromial space. It might be because um, the acromion is really big. It could be because the um, supraspinatus tendon is enlarged, but that's primary impingement. Secondary impingement is um, impingement due to things like uh, capsule laxity. Um, so it's, it's moving around in here too much. Um, or tightness of the capsule. It can't move or depress into the fossa enough and keeps, keeps hitting um, up here on the acromion. So that's a hypermobility or a hypomobility um, of the shoulder joint. Posture, that forward shoulder posture, narrows this space in here. Um, weakening of the rotator cuff muscles. The rotator cuff muscles um, help to depress the head of the humerus and the fossa, and so if those are weak, it rides high and impinges um, the structures up here, which are primarily the supraspinatus tendon and a bursa. And if the scapular musculatures, the ones that stabilize the scapula back and down, are weak, as you'd see in six scapula, um, the acromion, the head of this, or the roof of it, comes anterior and down, um, <clears throat> and therefore narrowing this space in here as well. Symptoms that you see are inflammation, tendonitis of the supraspinatus and the long head of the biceps, which is shown right here, um, and then a subacromial bursitis. Treatment, um, Almost always we're going to start with correcting the posture. Um, get that scapula back and down. Um, you may need to use some inferior mobilizations or posterior mobilizations of the glenohumeral joint if we see restrictions there. Um, scapula stabilization strengthening is of the middle and lower trapezius. Um, rotator cuff strengthening starting out probably with isotonics 
um, and concentrating on concentrics, but as they get stronger, they'll move them into the eccentric strengthening. Um, PNF strengthening is a, um, a great thing to utilize. Um, might even need to do some core stabilization if they're a thrower um, and they have weakness in the core. They're having to utilize more of the muscles of the, the shoulder in order to throw a ball. <clears throat> and by strengthening the cord, we take the load off of the glenohumeral joint. Um, okay. So this, if um, an impingement um, is um, continues to go on, and especially in the rotator cuff, we have weakness that can result in a tear, typically the supraspinatus, um, right up at the insertion of the tendon into the bone. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to see if we can show here a little video clip of the surgery of rotator cuff. Um, this is about 10 minutes, so um, you can just watch and um, see what they do for a rotator cuff surgery. Rotator cuff surgery, our patients are in the upright beach chair position. First, we point out the AC joint. Next, we point out the coracoid, an important landmark in shoulder surgery. Now we point out the anterior lateral border of the acromion, the lateral border of the acromion, and next we palpate our glenohumeral joint. Our fingers grasp the humeral head. We next confirm the joint line with a spinal needle, and when it slides in easily, we use a scalpel, make our incision, through which we will insert the arthroscope. We use a metal blunt cannula and insert this through the posterior capsule into the joint. We then place our camera through this cannula and then we turn on our water supply. We are in the joint and immediately create an anterior portal in the rotator interval with the spinal needle. We are lateral to the coracoid. We make an incision and then insert our plastic cannula. You see the orange tip coming through the tissue. We use this cannula to pass instruments in and out of the joint. We start our diagnostic exam of the shoulder. Humeral head is to the right and the glenoid is to the left. This is the anterior labrum, a little tattered but not detached. We slide into the axillary pouch. We then bring our camera up the back of the glenoid, and now we visualize the long head of the biceps. We again focus on our anterior labrum, and just to the right, the thick band of tissue is the middle glenohumeral ligament. Beneath the cannula was a subscapularis. We next use our shaver to debride and smooth the rough edges of the anterior labrum, which showed some degenerative tearing. We next maneuver our shaver above the long head of the biceps to the area of the rotator cuff tear. We pause here, the anterior supraspinatus is torn and flipped immediately into the glenohumeral joint. These torn edges are hypovascular and need to be debrided. We also need to remove these torn edges to better evaluate our tendon tear. Now, as we continue with the shaver, you clearly see the defect in the tendon much better as we progress. It is not attached to the footprint of the greater tuberosity. You clearly see this area, and a little more debridement with a shaver will help us completely prepare the undersurface of the rotator cuff tear. We pause on the tear, and you see the dark area to the right is a small crescent-shaped rotator cuff tear not attached. We next move to the subacromial space and place the arthroscope in the space, and we created a lateral portal we inserted the same cannula and our shaver to perform a bursectomy. We begin our bursectomy. The fluffy white tissue is the bursa, which we need to clean out in order to visualize. Just above our shaver is the shiny white coracoacromial ligament, which is attaching to the anterior lateral border of the acromion. This is the location of a spur. We next bring our cautery device, which ablates soft tissue and is also capable of stopping any bleeding from the bursa. Our shaver is then used again in the lateral gutter of the subacromial space. We must clear out this bursal tissue, which is covering the bursal side of our rotator cuff tear. To the right of our shaver, the pink tissue is our deltoid. When our bursectomy is complete, we see our small rotator cuff tear. We must then prepare the edges of the tear and the underlying bone for the rotator cuff repair. The shaver is actually inside the tear in the glenohumeral joint and then lightly removing soft tissue from the underlying bone of the greater tuberosity footprint. 
We need a bleeding surface for the tendon to heal to. Here is a nice view of our one centimeter supraspinatus tear. The underlying yellow surface is the bone of the tuberosity. We must now localize the correct angle of approach for our anchor. In the subacromial space, we confirm the spinal needle location. We make a nick in the skin and insert our punch to make a pilot hole for the anchor. We find the correct spot in the tuberosity. And then we mallet this punch down to the black line that lets us know how far to go. Once our punch is all the way down, we insert a tap to prepare the bone for the anchor. The small yellow globules you see are fat from the bone. Once the tap is seated, we can remove the tap knowing our bone is prepared and we are ready to place our bioabsorbable anchor which you see here. We place this at the same angle of approach into our prepared pilot hole. We seat the anchor at the black line again and then we pull on these sutures to assure the anchor is well seated in the bone. We next must create an accessory portal again with a spinal needle, make a skin incision, and then we insert another slightly larger black cannula you see here. We then use a suture retriever and retrieve our first suture through the cannula. This is our suture lasso, a metal device for shuttling suture through the tendon. We place it in the subacromial space and pierce the rotator cuff tendon medial to the tear, assuring a good healthy bite of tendon. We come out through the tear with the lasso, which is cannulated and produces a wire loop, which we take out our accessory anterior portal. The suture awaits, we place this in the loop, and we shuttle this back through the rotator cuff tendon, as you see here. We again use our retriever to take a blue and a white suture out our anterior cannula again. We repeat the same step with our suture lasso, holding onto the edge of the tendon for tension. We pierce the tendon medial to the tear, produce our lasso, and again we retrieve this lasso loop out our cannula. We shuttle our two sutures through the tendon. Our grasper retrieves the last white suture and takes it out our anterior cannula. We again pierce the tendon medial to the tear, posterior to our other sutures, we produce our lasso and pull this again out our anterior cannula. We put the suture through the loop. You see this here outside the body. And then we pull the suture through the loop and again into the subacromial space, shuttling this through our rotator cuff tendon. All four sutures are now through the tendon and we must grasp corresponding sutures to tie our knots. Here we took two white sutures. Outside the cannula, we are tying a special sliding knot called the SMC knot. By pulling on one end of the suture, we now slide down into the subacromial space our knot, and our knot pusher device pushes this knot firmly down onto the rotator cuff, indenting the cuff nicely. We tie half hitches, which are multiple knots, on top of this knot. You see us tying outside the cannula, and this will really tighten the knot down and cinch down the rotator cuff down to the anchor. When we are complete, we retrieve our blue sutures as we have now placed the white sutures in another cannula to prevent tangling. Once we have pulled these sutures outside the body, we again tie our same knot. You see our knot pusher sliding the suture down to cinch the knot down firmly, which is quite important. We next prepare for our lateral anchors. We need one of each suture, one blue and one white. Thus, we retrieve these to load outside the body into our push lock anchors, which as you will see, will firmly pull the tendon down over the footprint of the greater tuberosity. We seat these anchors in the good lateral bone of the greater tuberosity. Our punch feels and confirms the bone is solid and we make a pilot hole as you see here. We then place the loaded push lock anchor into the pilot hole. Before we seat the anchor, we pull the slack 
out of our sutures to assure the tendon is snug down. When we are pleased, we seat our anchor, as you see, and we cut the ends of the suture. We then repeat this step again with the next set of sutures, pulling them out the lateral cannula. Here you see us loading them into the eyelet of the push lock device. We again make a pilot hole in the lateral cortex with the punch, a good one centimeter posterior to our other push lock. We then place our anchor into this hole, pull the slack out of our sutures, and when we are satisfied, we seat our push lock anchor. These anchors give us an interference fit for the sutures laterally. They effectively create a double row rotator cuff repair without needing to place more anchors in the small greater tuberosity footprint. Here is our final repair viewed from the lateral portal. See how the sutures are all tied medially in the tendon and the ends are pulled over the lateral aspect of the tendon to this lateral row of anchors. The tendon is pulled flush over the greater tuberosity footprint, increasing the surface area for tendon healing to bone. We internally and externally rotate the arm and you can see a solid repair that is quite stable. Okay, so just a view of what um, a rotator cuff um, tear repair looks like. You can now imagine then that um, as they suture that tendon together and they don't want that um, repair to split, the splint that is put on um, patients postoperatively is called an airplane splint. And um, they're usually in this splint for um, anywhere from four to six weeks, depending on the extent of the tear as well as the repair. Uh, active range of motion will start one to two months post-surgery, again depending on the surgical um, repair, how much they had to do. And normal range of motion is to be expected at 10 to 12 weeks post-operatively. This is a pretty intense surgery and um, quite a bit of rehab time. The next um, thing we're going to talk about is labral tears. Um, and in your notes, I have um, the distinction between two labral tears. One is what's called a glenoid labral tear, which is just an isolated tear of the labrum from the glenoid. Um, and they go in, they suture that together. The other one, though, is um, fairly common. It's called a slap lesion. And it's the superior labral tear from anterior to posterior as far as interaction. So you can see that tear up in this, in this area. <clears throat> the long head of the biceps attaches up into this area and is pretty involved, um, usually in the cause of the slap lesion. Um, so here's the long head of the biceps attaching to the top of the labrum. And if the arm moves quickly, and this is on an eccentric pole, it can sometimes cause a tearing um, of the labrum up at the top. Um, I've heard it said that um, over 90% of the pitchers in the major leagues have um, tears of their labrum in this region um, just because of the force and then the um, extreme deceleration force of the um, arm and the long head of the biceps when they're pitching. Um, this condition can also sometimes be associated with glenohumeral instability or laxity. Um, <clears throat> when these are trying to heal or if they've had surgery, the thing that needs to be remembered is that shoulder flexion needs to be avoided um, because it recruits the long head of the biceps and that can pull that off um, as well as um, elbow flexion and supination again because of the involvement of the long head of the biceps. So um, I have a little clip of um, just a, this doesn't have any voice to it um, explaining but it kind of shows you um, in a cartoon or caricature of what's going to take place with a slap lesion repair.
that's a pictorial of um, what happens. Um, and this next section is um, just an eight minute video of the actual surgery. Um, this surgery is actually a little, quite a bit more common. We'll see this um, in the sports medicine world um, more than the rotator cuffs. So I think you get a good appreciation for um, what takes place in the um, involvement. This is fairly significant. So this video surgery. is to review steps to successfully treat shoulder slap lesions arthroscopically utilizing Smith & Nephew instrumentation and implants. The patient failed conservative treatment resulting in an arthroscopic procedure performed in the lateral decubitus position. A posterior portal is made using a Dionyx 5.5 millimeter cannula, followed by creating an anterior rotator interval portal using an arthroscopic needle for localization. Prior to making the rotator interval portal, care should be taken to confirm that the tip of the needle can touch each individual structure that will need to be addressed within the glenohumeral joint. The needle is then removed and the clear track cannula is inserted. A probe is utilized through the anterior portal to demonstrate the superior labral detachment. A 4.5 millimeter full radius dionic shaver is utilized to debride the damaged labrum back to healthy tissue. A bleeding surface is created using a motorized shaving device to prepare the glenoid. Note the slap tear progresses posteriorly and superiorly. A final bleeding surface is demonstrated here between the superior labrum and the glenoid bone. Looking from the anterior portal posteriorly, the posterior inferior labrum is intact, but the posterior superior labrum is detached and ready for repair. A localizing needle is introduced at the anterior lateral edge of the acromion in order to enter the glenohumeral joint just anterior to the long head of the biceps and the supraspinatus rotator cuff tendon. Percutaneously, a 2.9 millimeter osteoraptor drill guide and obturator are introduced and then driven posterior to the biceps and placed on the face of the glenoid. A drill is introduced through the guide and the 2.9 millimeter osteoraptor suture anchor is introduced. A penetrating device is introduced through the anterior superior percutaneous incision to grasp a suture posterior to the biceps tendon. A crochet hook is utilized to deliver the sutures posterior to the biceps and then tied. You may choose to pass and tie the anterior sutures first rather than the posterior stitches as I've done here. Another option is to pass both a white and black suture in tandem together and then tie individually. Care must be taken to place all knots on the back side of the labrum away from the glenohumeral joint articulation. A 
penetrator is reintroduced again through the percutaneous incision anterior superiorly and brought underneath the labrum just anterior to the long head of the biceps. The second set of sutures are then tied anteriorly. A posterior Wilmington portal is then utilized to place an additional anchor posterior superiorly. This may be done percutaneously or through a cannula as you see here. A 2.3 millimeter osteoraptor anchor is placed. The penetrator device is inserted through the posterior Wilmington portal and the suture is shuttled around the labrum. The posterior labral anchor is tied and then probed to check for stability. The arm is taken down from the balance suspension arm holder and assessed for stability and freedom of range of motion. Following the surgery, patients are advised to wear a pillow sling for four weeks and a regular sling for an additional two weeks. Therapy is started at approximately one to two weeks after surgery. Active range of motion begins at six weeks. The patient is transitioned to a strength training program at 12 weeks postoperatively. Okay, uh, next on your notes is, oh, there's just a caricature of this slap um, repair. Next on your notes is a note about adhesive capsulitis, which we don't see much in a population under the age of 30. <clears throat> um, but occasionally you may come across it. It's commonly referred to as frozen shoulder or arthrofibrosis. Um, the causes are unknown, or it could be um, related to an acute injury, a fall on um, the arm. Symptoms are a capsular pattern, um, motion loss. Um, so you see external rotation is significantly limited, um, followed by abduction and flexion. Um, with treatment, they can get better in six to nine months. This is a long process, and lots of active range of motion, keeping joint mobs to um, a pain-free uh, or pain limiting motion, so we want to be fairly comfortable, um, yet we have to kind of try to increase the mobility of the capsule. Um, if they don't receive treatment, um, literature says that they'll probably get better on their own, but it's going to take two to three years, so that's a long time. Um, adhesive capsulitis um, patient here that is um, trying to perform a shoulder elevation, you can see a lot of the substitution patterns up in the um, deltoid upper trap area and this is really common um, and they'll probably function like this for a while before they really recognize that the problem is coming from the glenohumeral joint and then go in to get it checked and start treatment. AC sprain um, is on your notes next um, divided into typically three grades. Um, the most severe being a grade three 
Uh, they used to commonly do repairs on these and suture these together, although they're finding that um, the function after uh, surgery is no better than if they didn't do surgery. Um, rehabilitation involves um, strengthening the entire shoulder. Um, all motions for grade one and two, um, being careful in the end range of motions uh, just because they can tend to continue to be tender. Um, and especially with horizontal adduction, um, we're really careful uh, as that compresses these areas and causes reproduction of pain symptoms. They typically get better on their own um, with some advice and consult with strengthening though. Um, and then the last one in your notes is a bicep tendon injury. Um, typically a tendonitis and inflammation here where the long head um, passes through the bicipital groove and up into the um, top of the labrum. This is the short head going to the coracoid process. Um, an irritation through here and is sometimes difficult to differentiate between um, that and a supraspinatus tendonitis. So um, it involves the use of modalities to decrease the pain initially. Um, working then into some isometrics that are pain-free or isotonics if those are pain-free um, and doing some gentle stretching into extension um, to stretch out the tendon um, can include supination and elbow flexion in the exercise program. These, um, these are a little difficult to, to treat. Um, they can be tricky to catch. Um, it's difficult to keep somebody from using their arm if this if they just have a little tenderness here. Um, but if they keep doing this, you get little micro tears in here that keep perpetuating the inflammation. Um, and uh, treatment um, is then not quite as effective. So um, sticking to modalities and then gentle strengthening and working into the eccentrics is able. So um, that's it for this lecture. We'll be doing a case study um, that you'll get in class or that you have gotten in class and reviewing that in the next lecture.